Welcome to uh, North Olmsted High School Computer Club's second internet security seminar. It's uh, presented in uh, association with the Friends of the Library. Um, we'll be talking tonight about identity security and social networking sites like MySpace. I'm Michael Stewart, president of the North Olmsted High School Computer Club. We have Michael Bruckner, vice president. This is Queso back there. Uh, Amanda Hoyt and Justin Wolf, George Andrews, and Lee Saunders will be presenting with us tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about um, what we covered in our previous center, seminar, in case anyone wasn't here. Uh, we'll be going back over viruses, trojans, all sorts of different things that can affect your computer, where they come from, how to protect yourself against them. Tonight, we're going to be covering new topics, what kinds of internet security information threats there are that uh, you might need to protect yourself against, what causes them, and how to protect yourself against these threats. And we'll be showing you a couple of them, giving you some examples. Um, and here to show us the threat cycle is my brother. Basically, when we talk about, at our last conference, we talked about computer-based security. And as Mike said, again, we're going to talk about internet-based security. Uh, this cycle here talks about um, what can happen whether you're talking about internet or computer-based security. And basically what happens is a user clicks a file or visits a website from a friend or a coworker. Um, at that point, a user is infected by malware, um, drive-by downloads, root kits, um, dialers, things like that. Um, uh, the malware exhibits means of propagation. Uh, that can be by email. Um, if you have a MySpace, we're going to be talking about ways that it can infect your profile and spread to other users of MySpace. Um, and then the whole threat cycle starts up again. OK, so we're first going to talk about uh, what types of computer threats there are. Um, the basic three that people are most uh, um, they most know about are viruses, worms, and trojans. Uh, viruses require a host file to infect. So a lot of times what happens is if you get a virus, your virus software will, will detect the file as being a virus, and it'll attempt to delete it, but it can't, because what it's doing is attaching to a system file which is protected, so your computer will not let it delete it. Um, some viruses are written just to be annoying. Um, others are written to cause harm. Um, another type of threat is a worm. It's a self-propagating threat, which means it has its own code, so it's going to automatically send out emails or seek out other computers on the network and spread uh, like that. Um, it does not require a host file, which makes it even more dangerous because it can hide in your pictures, in your Word documents or Excel documents, or any documents that you use on a daily basis. Um, and then the, the third most common type is a Trojan. Um, most Trojans are designed as a legitimate program, and because of the way they're designed, they have to be invited onto the system. And when we say that, what we mean is that, uh, for example, a Trojan may be um, hiding in a uh, keyboard remapper. And a keyboard remapper is a legitimate program. It allows you to change the keys, so instead of hitting a D key, you would hit a K key. Um, people use that, programmers use that to make it more convenient for them. But a Trojan can be hiding behind that, so the virus software won't detect it. Okay, now where do these threats come from? Um, some unavoidable sources include spam, drive-by downloads. Um, we're going to hit on that later, but basically what that is, is you're, you visit a website and you're instantly infected with malware, and you'll never know it. So we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, we also can talk about rogue instant messages, where you're, you will be infected by a virus or a Trojan, it will uh, find an AAM client or whatever instant messenger you use, and it will automatically send itself out to users on your buddy list. Um, other sources include things that you may accidentally do without even realizing it. Um, when you go to Internet Explorer and you go to Google and you misspell it, that can lead to it. Um, and not watching what you click. 
For example, when you get a um, when you get an email, it may say click this link to go to Google. If you hover over that link, it may not actually be going to Google. It may be going to a site that has a drive-by download, uh, a Trojan, or a virus. Okay, now we're going to talk about how we protect ourselves more on the computer aspect. Um, there are two ways that we like to, to tell people to protect themselves. One is physical and one is mental. Um, when we talk about physical, we're talking about antivirus, firewall, anti-spyware programs, and things of that nature. Um, all of you received a free CD with free and open source uh, software, which means programmers can take that code and change it, but they can never charge for it. Uh, it's in the back of your binder. Uh, we've included a VAS, um, an AVG, both of those are free virus software programs, um, as well as SpyBot Search and Destroy is on the CD, and that's an anti-spyware program. Um, and then you can use a firewall program such as Zone Alarm. Um, and also to protect yourself, we tell people that not only is it physical, but it's mental. You need to be aware of these threats, and you need to be careful with what you're doing. So hover over a link before you click it, um, whether in an instant messenger, uh, whether in an email, or even um, when you're in a website. If you look at the bottom bar, it will actually tell you where you're going. Uh, make sure you check the website spelling. One of the most common uh, misconception or mistyped websites is Goggle. Instead of, uh, spelling Google instead of G-O-O-G-L-E, they spell it G-O-G-G-L-E dot com. Um, that site has drive-by downloads and malware, but again, you don't see that. Um, and one of the most important things is to not believe everything that you read. Um, I can say from personal experience that I've gotten emails from Fifth Third Bank. I'm not even a Fifth Third customer um, telling me to change my account information or update the account information. Um, tonight we have a video that we're going to show you that was put on by a security firm, and they're going to show you what happens when you put in information like that. Um, so thank you for your attention, and now we're going to talk about internet-based security. security threats for tonight. We have uh, wireless network security. Um, anyone who has a wireless network um, <clears throat> can put on uh, passwords to protect it. If you don't, if you have an unsecured wireless network, which would be a network that you do not password protect, anyone can connect to your wireless network that has a wireless card. Uh, your wireless network can be connected to by neighbors if they're within the range, by people driving down the street with a laptop and are seeking to put something onto your system. Um, you can have accidental intrusion is more like the case of the neighbor where they're just within range of your network and their computer automatically connects to the nearest and strongest network signal and they're now in your network and can connect to your computer and um, directly affect your system. Malignant intrusion is the man driving down the street with the laptop who decides that he wants to install a virus on your system so he connects to your uh, wireless network and infects you. Um, there are different forms of protection that you can uh, use for your wireless network. There are uh, media access control addresses, but these can be spoofed. Uh, wireless equivalent privacy encryption which is the older form of the password used to protect your network. But uh, the FBI showed in 2003 that that can be cracked in three minutes. The latest forms are WAP and WAP2. Um, and it's most useful when you use a five word passphrase or use just random digits or when you use a full 64 character hexadecimal uh, code. Um, I believe that Mrs. Queso actually has a story to share with us yeah. about wireless network intrusion. Um, this is something that actually happened to me, which was rather interesting. I don't know that I really need this. I talk rather loud anyway, but I'm going to try it anyway. There we go. Um, 
I live in a neighborhood where I thought that most of my neighbors were not technologically savvy, which was rather interesting when I came home one day. Actually, I think my husband saw it first, and he says, did you print off a bunch of pictures of your brother's dog? My brother's dog's name is Semper. And he says, there's all these pictures of Semper sitting on the, the printer. And I says, ah, no, why would I have done such a thing? He says, well, there's about five sheets on the printer here that has some message underneath it. And it said, your wireless network is not secure. You might want to do something about that. <laughs> so not only did my neighbor use up a lot of my inkjet ink to print up all these pictures with this message underneath, he not only did it on my upstairs printer, but he accessed my downstairs printer, which is on our network as well. So it was sort of a wake-up call to me because it was like my house was intruded on. Okay. Not only was he able to access my printers, but in order to get that picture, he had to get into my file system on my computer and find that picture. Okay. So that means that he could have gotten into anything. Now I use Microsoft Money. Okay. He could have gotten into my financial <coughs> files. Okay. So that was really a wake-up call there. And this is just a neighbor who happened to be giving me, you know, a little message there that that's something you need to do something about. And at that point, I did not have web encryption on my machines. I didn't have WAP. Now it turns out that the cards that we have on our machines are only web capable. All right, so I really don't even have the highest level that I can, but that's only because we have one or two cards that are not capable of it. Um, one of the other things that I had done and I thought made my, secure, my network more secure was that I had changed the password on my router. It wasn't enough in that case. Okay, so that's one of the things that you might want to consider on that is that if you have a wireless network, and this is something that they've been talking more and more about, is that people are getting into these wireless networks and actually making changes to your router without you knowing it. Okay, and that is something that we're going to get into called farming. And it's happening not only with people in the neighborhoods and that, and probably not so much there, because it takes somebody fairly savvy there, but if you go to Starbucks, and you're accessing their wireless network, just how secure are you, okay? Because you don't know what kind of security they have on that network, and it's probably not very much, okay? So that's one of the things to consider. Yeah. Right, one of the things that has been coming up, and this is something I just learned about, is a botnet. And apparently, they are becoming quite prevalent in the world. As a matter of fact, one of the latest estimates is that there are approximately 4,700,000 zombie computers around the world. And what a zombie computer is, is simply a computer that has had some information downloaded where it can actually be controlled by another computer somewhere else in the world. A lot of these are over in Russia or the Ukraine. Um, I think some of them were in the Oriental countries as well. And, but most of it was coming from what was the former Soviet Union. Okay. where they are actually using these then to control your computer to send out spam, okay, and to, send, and to propagate this botnet. Okay, so basically what's happening is that your computer is doing things without your knowledge. And we have a little video coming up shortly that's going to show you an example of what happens when this occurs, okay, how this can actually take control of your computer if you're not careful. Okay. Um, firewalls are one of the best ways to protect yourself against this sort of a threat. Okay. You can't be attacked if you have a firewall there that's going to keep these sort of things from getting into your computer. And that's one of the things to work on. Okay. One of the other things that uh, I was reading that was rather interesting is uh, Apple is not nearly as secure as we thought it was. Okay. Um, they are not the most popular operating system out there and because of that the virus writers are not attacking them as much however there was a group that decided to test Apple's security and their networking security they held it a month of bugs okay the month of Apple bugs and what they did was start sending out these security breaches they were testing different ones one thing every day for a month Okay, and they actually have a site that was saying that we were able to break this, we were able to break that, etc. So Apple's not as secure as they have been, or as they, most people think they have been. So that was something that they wanted to bring to Apple's attention that they needed to start building more security into their systems, just like Windows does. 
Okay, because if people do start buying more and more Apple computers, okay, then they are going to need to have their operating system more secure as well, as well as their networking, which uh, the older version is called Apple Talk, okay, which is something that they needed to work on. Okay. All right. I'm going to be talking to you about phishing and farming, which are two methods internet base for stealing information from you. Harmful sites uh, and the image of legitimate ones are being used to steal information. Um, phishing will redirect the user to a harmful site with a link or an incorrect spelling, often through email. You'll see, click this link, and it will take you, instead of to the legitimate site that you believe it will take you to, to some copy of the site that looks just like the site but is instead recording all of the information you enter into it. Farming instead hijacks your browser to automatically redirect the, the farmer to a malicious site, re redirect you to the farmer's malicious site, even if you type in the legitimate site by altering uh, hardware on your computer. And we have an example here, a YouTube video. Instead of, you can't see the link very well here, but instead of just putting usbank.com, they'll put usbank.com some other website. Um, here, we've got George Andrews to explain a little bit more and better. All right. So pretty much what they do is they, they'll have, uh, up there you can see youtube.com. What they can sometimes do is go YouTube dot uh, hackersite.com which is actually what's called a subdomain of hackers.com it's just a different part and if you look on uh, sites that you have to log into it'll usually come up with login dot your site dot com and that's one of the easy ways to uh, know that it's actually a phishing site. Is it right? I guess we're going to keep talking. Maybe should be 
Unfortunately, with a lot of these videos, different times of day makes a difference as to how quickly they load. When we were here practicing on Saturday, this was coming up immediately. But because this is later in the evening, sometimes it's a little bit longer because people are at home now and doing their email and whatever else, you know, fishing the internet and that, or surfing the internet and that sort of thing. So it tends to slow things down considerably. Okay, so it takes a little bit longer. Go ahead. All right, here we've got uh, another example. This is uh, National City's warning about phishing sites. Um, this is their sample phishing email. They point out a few things. Um, the message is going to make a request for action to click on a link or uh, reply to the email, and you'll never actually want to do that. Uh, in this link, it appears to be a legitimate site, but if you hover over the link, as you can see where it says number three in the green bubble, uh, it's not actually directing you to the site that the hyperlink says. Um, if you float over the hyperlink, it's going to show you where you're actually being directed to. This is no longer state of the art and won't necessarily work but that's one way they can redirect you to a harmful site. Um, and the request could be polite or threatening. It, what the text says doesn't matter so much as long as you can tell that it's a phishing email. And here's their example of a phishing site. Uh, things they'd like to point out are that in the URL bar, it says HTTP instead of HTTPS, which indicates a secure site, such as any site that deals with financial information should be. Also, they point out that a little lock icon will appear in the bottom here of any actual secure site, not anywhere on the web page. Um, anything that says VeriSign secured None of those graphics matter. They're just, they can just be downloaded and put into any site and don't actually indicate anything. Um, and the text boxes up there will take and record your information instead of sending it legitimately to the US Bank, National City, sorry, National City site. Uh, official logos also can be used in phishing sites. They're also merely graphics and often are not well enough protected that they're indicative of any measure of security in the site. Here's George again. Now we can work it. Hi, I'm Corey, one of Live Security's analysts. Today, the Live Security team noticed an email arriving in a lot of people's inboxes saying it was coming from U.S. Bank. We took a look at the email and figured out it was a phishing email. We thought we might share some tips to help you recognize what these phishing emails look like. Let's take a look. At first glance, this email appears to come from U.S. Bank. It asks that you confirm your bank data by clicking the provided link. This alone should make you suspect this email since most banks never request these sorts of banking details randomly via email. Next, let's look at the link we see in the email. While the link starts with U.S. Bank, it appears to go to a domain called ebankingservices.com. I would expect the link from U.S. Bank to go to usbank.com. Furthermore, links to sensitive banking data should happen securely. This link starts with HTTP rather than HTTPS, telling me the link does not use a secure connection. This email already looks pretty suspicious, and we haven't even looked at the source code that generates it. Looking at the email source code, we can see the real URL the link redirects you to. I'll paste it to Notepad so you can see it better. 
Looking at this source tag, I can see that the link showing in the HTML email was a front for the real link, which goes to a domain in Hong Kong. I really doubt U.S. Bank, emphasis on the U.S., keeps their secure online banking servers in Hong Kong. Looking at the source a bit more, I can also see the body of the email was a GIF image. Here it is. This picture probably created this as an image-based email to help it get past spam filters. So here's one other interesting tidbit. Buried within the source of this email was a little message. Uh, we can only speculate whether the hacker is trying to tell us something or whether this was just his way of trying to trick spam filters. But let's take a look at it. In short, the message outlines the general geography of Klang, a state in Malaysia, and mentions chastisement for the assassination of a British man. Obviously, it has no place in a legitimate U.S. bank email. Finally, I'm going to visit this malicious phishing site just to show you what it looks like. Please don't do this yourself. Any site that hosts a malicious phishing attack could just as easily host a drive-by download. As soon as I hit the phishing site, I get a pop-up warning me that it's a suspected web forgery. This message comes from Firefox 2's built-in anti-phishing feature. Internet Explorer 7 has this type of feature too, and I recommend you pay attention to its warnings. However, for now, let's ignore it. I'll go ahead and fill in this sign-on request with some fake credentials. The fisher is capturing everything I enter, so if I use my real U.S. bank credentials, he'd know my sign-on. This next page asks me for more personal information, such as the company I work for, the state I live in, and my email address. But look at the bottom of this page. It says my connection is secure, but that's just a graphic. If you look at the URL for this page, it says HTTP instead of HTTPS, which tells me it is not secured. This is another tip off that this page isn't legitimate. I hope these tips help you catch the next phishing email. However, this example no longer represents the state of the art in phishing technology. Clever fishers use much more sophisticated techniques that are harder to detect, so be careful with the email. If there's an email message that you're concerned with but you want to follow up on, don't click the link in the email. Rather, open your web browser and manually type the URL you're trying to visit. For ongoing security analysis, you should also check out our podcast, Radio Free Security on iTunes. See you on the wire. about uh, what goes on in phishing. Usually, it's email-based, so the hacker will find spam for computers that are infected, such as the zombies, the, the zombie computers, uh, computers with viruses on them, just anything to get the emails to you. And so, what usually happens in phishing is, uh, it sends you to a fraudulent uh, web page, unlike farming, which takes control of your hardware. So, uh, and also, there are a couple things that you have to keep in mind. You have to actually enter your information to be affected by phishing. So you ha actually have to go to the website, type in what you have. It's really not paying attention is the problem. Um, you know, the uh, real representatives should never ask you for your personal information over the internet. If they're asking you for bank accounts, passwords, um, PIN numbers, things that you usually would not enter into a legitimate site, don't enter it because it's most likely a phishing site. And just don't do it. <laughs> Uh, and as the video that you've just seen has shown, the, uh, it's really gotten much easier to detect phishing, even though 
the Fisher's technology has gotten better. So has the protection. Like Internet Explorer now has a phishing feature. Um, Firefox 2 has a phishing feature. And they should inform you, but still be aware that it can happen. Um, just to show you how easy it is to uh, make a phishing site, I quickly whipped up a Google page. We'll show you. Uh, all right. Can you tell the difference between this page and this page? Exactly. That's the only thing that's really different other than that small change in where the line is. Right. And which you won't notice if you're just searching. So you have to pay attention to the, the URL. Okay. If it had anything other than, well, usually for financial information, it will be HTTPS, which is uh, a way to encrypt your information. So if encodes your information, sends it to the site where it decodes the information, and then it's used. Um, what George isn't telling you is that he created that site. <laughs> okay. Just so you know. and actually do damage by redirecting wherever you type your URL to. The URL being the address that you're actually trying to find. And what I usually do to try and explain this in simple terms is that when you're looking up somebody's phone number, you use a phone book. When you look in the phone book, you look for their name. Okay, and then it attaches the name to the phone number, you use the phone number to actually contact the person. That's basically the same way that the internet works. You type in a word address. Okay, it may have dots in it, but it's basically words. That then, your browser then connects to a machine out on the internet that is called a DNS, okay, a domain name server. And what that does then, it's like a phone book. It connects those words to the numerical address of where this actually is. Every machine that's on the internet has its own set of numbers. Okay, that's called an IP address. Okay, it's kind of like a phone number. Once it does that, it says, oh, okay, if you're looking for this word address, then you really want to go to this machine. And when everything's working correctly, you go to the right place. However, what farming can do is that somebody can actually access your wireless router and change where it's going to find its phone book. Okay, that DNS server gets changed in the wireless router, you'll never know it, okay? And it will then go to that server, and this server then says, oh, well, let's see, we've got this, mach or this machine over here that is supposed to be US Bank. It's not really, okay, it's a phishing site. But when you put it in, in your address, you never see a difference. And all the other ones that they were showing you with the phishing, the address that you see up at the top kind of gives you an indication it's not going to the right place. And that's what the phishing aspects now that they've built into um, Internet Explorer 7 and into Firefox 2 will tell you, hey, this is dangerous, this is not the right site. But it can't tell that when it's using the farming problem, okay? Because it's actually going to a different phone book, and the phone book is what's wrong. And it's a machine, okay? Your browser can't detect that part, 
right? So that's what makes it dangerous. So what they're doing that is reassociating, okay, your addresses, okay? And typically their DNS server is going to have a certain set of sites that it wants you to go to. Now, of course, that means that it has to be ones that you are going to commonly access. Banking sites, maybe Google, things like that. So that it's actually going to the wrong sites in that case. Now, there are some ways to protect against that. Okay. Um, actually, did we have a slide that has the, the diagram? There we go. That's the one I wanted. Okay. Basically, this is the process that it's following through. You type in the word address. It goes to the browser that connects then to that DNS server. The DNS changes the words into the IP address, and then you go to the site. Well, if it's the wrong DNS server, that's where you're going to get to your malicious site, okay, without even realizing it. Okay, and I think now we have some information on how to fix that. Okay, do you want to continue or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> All right, um, I did a lot of the lookup for this part of it. Uh, one of the best ways to take care of this is to protect your wireless router and also to realize that when you're going to a public site like Starbucks or a bookstore, any place that has Wi-Fi, realize that they could be compromised. Okay? I would never go to Panera's and sit there having coffee and bagels and try to access my banking. Okay? It would be dangerous because I don't know that their router hasn't been compromised. Okay? Everything may look good for my aspect, and I may be as careful as possible, but if their router's compromised, I'll never know. Okay? At home, you can protect yourself. If you have a wireless access, that you can actually go through and change the password on your wireless router because all these routers come with a default password, and these farmers know that. They know the default passwords for all these different systems, for the D-Link, for the Syslink, um, for Netgear, okay? There's a whole bunch of different ones out there that they have some common, easily figured out passwords for them. All right. Also, you, of course, you want to take care of the encryption like the WAP or WAP, okay? That helps to secure it, but especially the password, because what happens is you can actually go to a website Okay, this is something that we were talking about, the drive-by downloads. This is another thing that they have actually tested and it worked on people who had not changed the passwords. Go to a website, they have a piece of code hidden in there that you don't see. And it will actually test for your router, see what the password, if you haven't changed the password, it will go into the router and change the DNS. You'll never see a thing. Okay. So this is where it's very important that you change that password so that these websites can't have that code in them that can actually go in and change your router's password. Okay, and ultimately the DNS for it. And so that was one of the main things. So. Um, okay, the drive-by downloads. This is something that basically you don't know what's happening. You've gone to a website. You might notice that it's taking an inordinately long time to load, but yet everything seems to be on the screen. Okay, that's one of the things that you might make might make you suspicious. And that typically means that it's doing something to your hard drive, it's doing something to your computer behind the scenes. Okay? That doesn't happen too often. I mean, some of it could be a very short piece of code and it seems like the page loads immediately, but it still do, have, it has done something very quickly to your hard drive or it could have access to your, DNS, your router and change the DNS on it. Right, so that's something that you need to be very careful of. Okay, and as well, I can't install the root kits, viruses, trojans, and all the things that we had alluded to earlier, uh, which can actually do damage to your machine by deleting files and messing up your system. Okay, you wanna go ahead? Now, where do these threats come from? I'm sure many of you in here have children, and I bet you most of them do have a MySpace or a Facebook yeah. or something along the lines of that. They're social networking sites that can be dangerous to your computer and to your identity. Let's see. Um, they can put viruses on your computer, malware, farming tax, everything you've alluded to can be done through your MySpace or Facebook. Things you would want to change would include your name, your age, 
You should never put your phone number on there, your email address, your address, your personality, all these things are in MySpace. They're very easily, it's very easy to change these things. You should change your password often, which you can do by multiple ways that you can change your MySpace to keep it private. You can change it so only your friends can view it or so that only people under 18 can view it. Um, you can also change it so that people can only add you by writing your last name or by your last name or your email address. Okay, in order to change your password, your city and state and everything, you go to account settings. You can change your email address right here. You can change your password down below, which you should change frequently. You can go to privacy settings. You can make it so only your friends can view it, only people under 18 can view it. Um, you can keep your friend requests to people you know by requiring email and last names. So they have to know one of those to add you as a friend. Um, okay, you can change it so you can block people. You can also, okay, let's, you just pick people you don't block in your room. Okay, look. Go to the home page. Okay, in order to change, <laughs> In order to change your city and address, you can go to Edit Profile, um, Basic Information. occupation, your city, country, everything like that, you would not want to put on your page. You can change everything where you should go in there. Okay, why these are dangerous. Anyone that has MySpace, unless you change one of the privacy settings, can look on your MySpace. They should be, I would say that your children should be 16 before they have one. But as you saw, you can easily change your age and your birthday to make it look like you are younger than you really are. Anyone can post anything about whoever they want on their blogs or on bulletins. Information about all the people or confidential information can all be posted on there. And the accounts can be harvested. They can be used to spread the malware infections or the viruses and the posts, like I said. Malicious blogs. Well, Online banking, um, type of information that can be stolen. There's credit card information, uh, number account information, and PIN numbers. Um, then also username, password, account information. All can be stolen through email scams and phishing sites. Um, indications of attack include email messages from your bank or bank that you don't belong to. Um, random charges to your credit card or bank account, um, and your password is suddenly invalid. That's done by people going in and changing your information so that they can access it, but you can. And I'm here to talk about how we can protect ourselves from these various threats. First off, you always want to change your password often is 
and frequently, maybe once a month or so, just change it so that if it does, if someone in fact steals your password, you can change it and then it won't work for them anymore and then you'll be safe again. And then also just do not download anything without knowing exactly what it is and you want to scan it first because oftentimes there's something hidden in what you're downloading and you don't know what it is exactly. And for any advertisements, advertisements are just a bad idea to cook on no matter how enticing it sounds with free laptops or thousands of ringtones for free and everything for free, their social, anything like that. And you can always change your information to stuff that's not real if you don't want it to be stolen by someone with malicious intent. Like on MySpace, you should be able to change all your information so that not be identified by that. And more and more employers are searching your MySpace pages to find out who you really are. And if you have anything bad on there, they'll know exactly not to hire you. And one of the most important things to avoid identity theft is to just do not post your email address, your phone number, or any other information that can be used to identify specifically you or be used to gather more information about you. And on MySpace, you occasionally see just weird posts or uh, messages that contain links that just like, hey, check this out, this is really great. I got a bunch of stuff for free and you can do it too. But really that's just another attack to get your information and steal your identity. And one of the, uh, the next one's just to be considerate and not to post information about other people without their consent, but they don't know what you're doing, just so that anything to, so that nothing happens to them. Right there in bold, if you do not post identifiable information, social networking sites are much, much safer. All right, uh, are there any questions about anything you've seen tonight? Anything you want to revisit? Other questions about internet security? Go ahead. Yeah, I've noticed you go into YouTube. Do you have to worry if you go to some place like that and watch their videos? Is that a risk? Actually, no, it's not. Because <clears throat> if you go to YouTube, what should happen if there's a virus is it should just not work at all. So the video won't show, period. And then if that happens, immediately back out so that hopefully nothing happened, run a scan and hopefully nothing happened. And if something did happen, the scan will hopefully detect it and then it should be fine. Just watch out. And YouTube is one of the more protected sites. Uh, they are trying to keep that one safer. Um, if somebody did try to post a video that had a problem associated with it, that is streaming video. So it's not downloading as much to your computer, okay? So because of the streaming aspect of it, that helps to protect your computer also. Other questions? If you're talking about you're using a laptop, a wireless network at a Starbucks or something, you're, so basically you're just relying on their security, and is there anything you can do if you're not in your own home using a laptop? If I were doing that at, at Starbucks, in which I have gone to Panera's and done stuff like that, if I'm going to innocuous sites that I, you know, just places that not financial related, I'm not going to use my credit card there, I'm not going to do any of my banking on my banking there. That's the kind of thing that you want to be careful of. If you were just going to visit a website and that, you would have to watch the same as you would at home. Okay, the same amount of security there. What you want to watch out for there is that you don't want to get redirected to a site that you don't know. Okay. That's really the only thing that you really have to be careful of going with Wi-Fi, is anything that has a financial nature to it. Um, when you do get the suspicious emails, are you just deleting them off your um, And how often do you have to update, you know, when you have a firewall or a different security system on there? Depends on the uh, type of system you have. If you have, if there's physical firewalls, which are typically in businesses, and it's built into their systems, they'll do the updating themselves. 
Um, if you have a wireless router that has its own firewall built in, you would want to periodically check for updates to what they call their firmware. It's the software that they actually use to run that particular piece of hardware. Um, you can check with their website. So for instance, if you're using D-Link, go to the D-Link website and see if they have any updates to their firmware. I would do it yeah, periodically, like maybe once a month, once every two months. And about the emails. Uh, the emails for phishing sites can't hurt you if you don't click on their links or go to the site they recommend you go to. So delete it and don't worry about it. And a lot of times, depending on, on where it's coming from, um, like Fifth Third, National City, most banking institutions will have, if you go to their website, they'll have a link somewhere on their web page that says report a website forgery or report uh, a phishing email. Um, and you'll be able to file a report with them. Maybe they'll have you forward the email along to them and they'll have their own internal investigation team when we look into it. So, um, and also in regards to the internet, or um, to the, the uh, virus software, depending on the type of virus software that you have, most of them should be set to configure themselves automatically and update themselves automatically. Um, the two that we included on the CD will automatically update themselves by default. AVG um, and Avast will both pop up the window that says your virus definitions were updated. Um, and they're typically set to do it every time you log on, so they should be kept updated automatically. Any other questions? A lot of the ISPs don't provide the various forms of security, like AOL and some of the others. How effective is it? It depends on the company who makes the web or who makes the virus software. Uh, for example, AOL uses McAfee. Um, no matter what you use, there's no one definite solution that's going to protect you 100%. Um, actually, there's a website called VirusTotal.com, and on that site, you can upload a suspicious file. And um, it will scan the file using 25 different virus scanners. And I can say that just yesterday I submitted a virus test file um, and one of them didn't even detect it. So there are going to be tons of different software out there, but there's no one, one piece of software that's most effective. Um, you want to keep in mind when you use virus software, you don't want to have more than one piece of software installed. Um, because they can conflict and one piece of software might start detecting the other as a virus. Um, Anti-spyware applications, it is okay to have multiple ones on there. Um, for example, we've included uh, Adware and Spybot Search and Destroy on the CD. Those can both be used concurrently in addition to one of the, the pieces of virus software. And one more thing, with uh, anti-virus software, you always want to use a brand name virus software because sometimes there's sites that just make up fake antivirus software that tells you that you have a virus when you really don't. And then they tell you to buy the upgraded version and then you can get rid of those viruses but really they just steal your information. And a follow up on the muscle. Um, at the beginning you mentioned, or Mr. Stewart mentioned, that sometimes uh, things will attach to your startup files. Uh, comes in. I, is there a way to off that happens? Uh, that was actually Mr. Brockner. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, it depends on the type of file. Um, I've helped a lot of people out, and what, what happens is it attaches to a system file. Those those are the things. Right. Um, and Windows depends on those files. Um, usually what you're going to have to do is take it in somewhere, or we've included information in the binder as well as in the next couple of slides that you can contact us. Um, if it attaches to a system file, there's a way to override your system files. It'll keep your documents and your settings and things like that, but it will wipe out the system files. So if there is a virus attached to it, it will delete it and override it with a fresh copy of the system file. Um, if it's a virus or a Trojan that has not attached to it, um, your virus software should automatically delete it and remove any kind of startup program like that. <coughs> Um, you know, a couple of times uh, some people have mentioned firewalls. Uh, does anybody on the panel have suggestions as software firewalls versus hardware? Any kind of preferences or preferences to which brands? I'm sorry. I you run, she runs our uh, firewall, firewall at school and our server at school. Well, I take care of the web server at school. The, uh, Mrs. Seelan takes care of the rest. 
Um, typically in a business, they're going to have an IT expert who is going to take care of any physical firewalls built into their systems. Um, I can't say that I'm an expert on that. Okay, our IT specialist in our school takes care of that part of it. Um, as far as software firewalls, there's a variety of them out there. Um, when you're working just at a home, you know, if you've got a home system or even a home network, a software firewall should be sufficient. Now, a lot of the routers will come with firewall capability built into them. My uh, ISP through home is called Windstream. Yeah, they took over from Altel, which was a land-based system, actually not wireless there. Uh, I happen to be in North Ridgeville. And their system actually has a firewall built in, but I don't rely just on that. Okay. So through my router that connects to the outside world, through my DSL, it has a firewall. But then I also use Norton uh, Internet Security, which has its own firewall built in on my laptop as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Something to follow up. Um, some firewalls, like uh, if you have Windows XP, it comes with a firewall. You want to make sure that there's both inbound and outbound protection. Uh, Windows XP only protects against inbound, I want to say, um, but not outbound. The new Windows Vista came out, and that includes bi-directional uh, protection. If you use Windows XP, I would say, <coughs> if you go to zonelabs.com, they have a free version that you can use. But you want to, again, you want to make sure it's bi-directional. So. You, were, you were talking before about uh, your, your wireless network, maybe not your wireless network. Your network at home, and you did not, so yours did not have WAP and WAP2 capabilities. Certain older carts may not have the WAP capability built into it. So that would be something you'd look for if you were buying it. You're buying a new one, yes, absolutely. So mine are called the WAP. Okay. So what do I do? It, well, you would want to check um, in your documentation with your wireless card to see if it has the capability of upgrading to WAP. If you can, switch that security system in there. There should be instructions with you. Are you talking about a wireless system? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, I just installed some last night and I put the code in to this computer. Okay. And that's um, that's a Like I said, just check. It should be in their settings. Okay, where you can actually switch it between having no security, WEP, or WAP. Okay. So something I do on the computer, I don't know if it'll reconfigure every laptop. No, no, that's actually because you're talking about doing it at your DSL, or at your, yeah, the DSL router. Okay, so that's where you want to do it there. Now that would be a firmware system where we're talking about the more hardware part of it. Okay, that's where you actually want to take care of that. So WEP and WAP is actually taken care of through the router itself, through your wireless access point. So that is a hardware type of firewall, but hardware security. Well, other than going to seminar like this, where else would you suggest we educate ourselves about all the different threats that are out there? White hat security. Go to www.whitehat.com. It's um, New for all the PCI. I don't know what to do well. Financial institutions, maybe. Them and trust way. And they have tons of information out there. You can read about all the exploits that are happening now. How to avoid them, the way they're happening, what attackers are doing. They get you. The new PCI standards and all the banking and any financial institutions are now required to incorporate into their networks. All of that's out there. And, uh, also, he shows you the uh, one YouTube video that was from Live Security, and they have a whole series of videos on YouTube for other demonstrations. You can look up those. Right. There were a few of them in the uh, process of the presentation you might have noticed that we kind of skipped over. Um, this presentation will be converted so that it can be posted on our website. Uh, there is the address in your packet. So that this whole presentation will be there. The link will be active at that point. And if you would like to check out those extra ones that we kind of skipped over, those are there also. You might have noticed when he closed out the one that there were also similar ones listed off to the side. So you might be able to check into some of the other ones too. They're rather educational. 
the YouTube videos actually tell you show you how to fix them? Give the staff a specific task? Um, mm -hmm. Some of them would tell you say, things simple ones like changing the password. Well, yeah, you know, know why use that specific. Just some, no, they're very general. They're very general. They're, they're not uh, high tech. These are the people who are involved in all of this, and some of them have decided to form their own company. Okay, so a lot of them have been going around and helping people for quite some time anyway, so they thought maybe they might form a company and actually do it for real. So if you would be interested in contacting any of them, their names are also included in your packets as well. So they've just kind of added this onto the end. And what kind of things they do? You know, hard drives? <laughs> Or Ask if you'd be amazed. Yes. Actually, Michael's been working with one of the girls at our And if they don't know how to do it themselves, they usually know who to go to to figure it out. Too. 